So what we do in this paper, we look how financial markets react to monetary policy announcements in the first half hour. And then we separate the effect of news about monetary policy in the announcement and news about the economy. And then we track how the economy responds. We do it for the US and for the euro area, and we use a, a vector autoregression. What we find is the following. So first, market reactions reflect both news about monetary policy and news about the economy. And the latter account for a non-trivial share of, uh, of the variance, as much as 35% in the US and even 45% in the euro area. And uh, depending on the mix of news in the announcement, the response of the economy is very different. So a, a surprise, well, we find that a surprise interest rate increases are contractionary when uh, they reflect news about monetary policy, so when they uh, re reflect a monetary policy shock. However, they can also be expansionary, and th this happens when they reflect um, uh, news about the economy. So the main implications are twofold. First, um, uh, private agents uh, learn something about the economy, not just about monetary policy, from central bank announcements. And second, this news about the economy, they attenuate the standard estimates of monetary policy effects, yeah, because we mix expansionary with contractionary shocks. So the plan of the presentation is the following. I'm going to start by showing you some data. Uh, then I'll explain how we relate to, to selected literature, and then I'll give you more details about the VR, the identification, the impulse responses that we find, and finally um, uh, quickly uh, explain the structure of the ESG inter interpretation. So the key data in this analysis are uh, what's called uh, the surprises. So if P is a price of a financial asset, and tau is the time of the, of the central bank announcement, a surprise is the change in the financial asset between uh, 10 minutes before and 20 minutes after the announcement. So we compute the surprises for interest rate derivatives, for, for, for Fed funds futures in the US, and for the Ionia swaps in the euro area. So um, our, um, our motivation is to, is to, to look at the, interest, uh, at the instrument that's liquid, and that reflects um, not just current policy rates, but also their expectations sometime into the future. So um, that reflects some near-term forward, gu forward guidance. So we, comp uh, we compute the surprises for the, those interest rate instruments and for the stock prices, S&P 500 in the US and uh, Euro stocks 50 for the Euro area. So to make it very concrete, let's, uh, let's look at one example of an FOMC announcement. So this one comes on March 20, 2001 at 2.15 p.m. So the following text is, uh, is released uh, to the public. The Federal Open Market Committee at its meeting today decided to lower its target for the federal funds rate by 50 basis points to 5%. What follows are um, a few paragraphs of, uh, of the analysis, which I have clipped. But the, the bottom line is that um, this analysis suggests substantial risks that demand and production could remain soft. Now, we know that this um, decision to cut um, uh, Fed funds rate by 50 basis points surprised the market. It was not priced in. If it had been priced in, we would see nothing in the, in the prices of the Fed fund futures. However, we know that Fed fund futures dropped between 205 and 235, yeah, our window um, for computing the surprises. So, um, so the markets did not price in such a big cut. They were expecting some, some interest rate, uh, some, some policy easing, but not as large as 50 basis points. So this was an ambiguously, uh, a surprisingly easy uh, monetary policy. Now, what's interesting is that stock prices also dropped in the same uh, half hour window. And this is surprising in light of a, of a simple uh, textbook analysis, which tells us that stock prices and interest rates should move negatively, conditional monetary policy shocks, right? So um, if, uh, if the Fed um, <clears throat> lowers the Fed funds rate, this stimulates the economy. This makes us expect um, higher future dividends. We uh, discount those future dividends with a lower interest rate. So the, the present discounted value of future dividends unambiguously goes up, meaning that stock prices should go up. However, they did not go up on, on March 20, 2001. And uh, more generally, they do not always go up 
were after surprise uh, uh, interest rate cuts, uh, uh, policy rates cuts. And this is the message of this, uh, of this picture. So here, um, every dot in the scatter plot, every dot is one FOMC announcement. On the horizontal axis, you see how the Fed fund futures changed in a half-hour window and uh, containing the announcement. And the vertical axis shows how much uh, stock prices, S&P 500, changed um, uh, in the same window. So the, the theory that uh, just, uh, just outlined uh, predicts that this sh these points should be aligned along a negatively sloped line through the origin. And what we see is that, uh, that uh, such a negatively sloped line through the origin is a, is a fairly poor uh, description of the, of the picture that we see, right? We see, uh, so the, the numbers in the corners, they, show, they count the interior points in different quadrants of the plot. So we see that uh, about one third of the points are in the, in the wrong quadrants. Now in the quadrants one and three, where stock prices and interest rates can move positively and not negatively. So, um, and also looking at the, at the right quadrant, right, we see that some large interest rate cuts are accompanied by very small uh, I increases in the stock prices, or some small interest rate cuts are accompanied by large increases in stock prices. So the relationship is weak. And um, uh, so there are different reasons why it could be weak. One, it could be noise uh, measurement error. So, uh, but the, um, uh, the story that we are exploring in this paper is that it's the information about the economy in the announcement that uh, moves uh, Fed fund futures and stock prices independently of the, inf of the information of, uh, about monetary policy. So specifically, we think that those points are, uh, are, are um, yeah, manifestations of two underlying shocks. A monetary policy shock, which uh, induces this negative uh, co-movement between interest rates and stock prices, and some other shock, which we call a central bank information shock, which uh, generates a positive uh, co-movement. So now in the rest of the paper, we, uh, we investigate whether, uh, depending on, um, on, on the mix of the two shocks, the responses of the economy differ. Yeah? So we use, uh, for that, we use a structural VR with a mix of um, sign restrictions and high-frequency identification. So, um, that's, um, so that, that's, uh, th that's what the paper is about. Now, let me say how we relate to, to some selected literature. First, there is a, a, a quite large literature, which is here represented by just a few citations, that studies interest rate surprises as proxies for monetary policy shocks, and then uh, uses the, the, those proxies to estimate the effects of monetary policy. So what we add to, to this large literature is, is, the, um, uh, is adding the information shock. Then there is a small, smaller and more recent subset of that literature, which, looks at, uh, which also looks at uh, central bank information, right? the information about the economy uh, contained in the announcements. And they, do, um, uh, and, and they, they follow mainly two approaches. One is to proxy the Fed's private information by looking at the differences between Fed's internal and confidential forecasts and the market forecasts at the same time. Another uh, strand of this literature looks at the, at the announcements themselves and uses text uh, processing tools to, to process these uh, and interpret these announcements. So we don't do any of this. We uh, outsource it to the markets to read these announcements for us and to, yeah, to, to appropriately digest them and to, and to, to, to react you know, um, according to, to what's surprising in them and to what extent uh, they, they contain surprises. So we've recently learned about these three uh, papers that also uh, follow this broadly this approach. So they also use market reactions to tease out the information uh, shocks from, from the announcements. But they differ in, in various implementation uh, details and in, in the scope. So finally, I want to mention uh, models of the information channel of monetary policy by Nakamura and Steinson and, and uh, Melosi. So the, these are models when there's, where there's some uncertainty about the economy and um, uh, agents figure out from interest rate decisions what, um, yeah, what the central bank thinks about the, about the economy and this helps them sharpen their own, uh, own views. And, but what we add to, to this is we add an independent uh, communication policy. So, Agents learn not just about, from interest rate decisions, but also from what the central bank talks, yeah, how, how it talks about the economy. Moreover, we use a VR. Uh, 
So let's get to, to the details of this, of this VR. So I'll, I'll focus on the, on the baseline model that we run for the US. So this is, um, a, uh, so we have a vector of seven variables. The first two are, are uh, the interest rate surprise and the stock price surprise. We map those, uh, those uh, half hour, th those, uh, those uh, intraday surprises onto a monthly indicator because our VR will be monthly. So we construct a monthly indicator that collects any surprises that occurred uh, in, a, in a given month. Um, the, the source is, 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 uh, is, is, is well known uh, RefHat's uh, data set. And then the following five variables are the standard macro and, and financial variables. Uh, such as uh, government bond yields, uh, stock prices, but this time the monthly average of them, GDP and GDP deflator, and the excess bond premium uh, as a proxy for financial conditions. So these are our these are the variables uh, in our VR, and we and we run a VR. Now the only thing that's unusual about this VR is that the first two variables they're IAD, right? They are surprises. So by definition, they're not uh, they're not predictable from the past of uh, of anything else. And therefore, uh, we, 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 this motivates the zero restrictions in, in the VR. Um, other than that, um, uh, the, the, the VR is standard, and we estimate it with standard Bayesian uh, methods with, with standard uh, priors. And um, so the, the, the Gibbs sampler with which we obtain the, the posterior also allows us to, to impute the missing, uh, the missing values of uh, M that, uh, that sometimes uh, uh, occur. So now this is the, the crucial slide, <clears throat> and it shows uh, how we identify uh, shocks in this VR. So we identify just two shocks. So this table shows you what, uh, the restrictions on the impact impulse responses that we're imposing so, uh, on, on all, all variables uh, and, uh, for these two shocks. So the first two variables are the, are the surprises. And, we and the zero restrictions reflect the fact that these, uh, these surprises are measured in, in a narrow half-hour window, and therefore they're unlikely to systematically represent uh, all other shocks uh, that are happening uh, in the economy. Right? Now, um, uh, the, the sign restrictions um, reflect our, our um, assumptions about the co-movement conditionally on, on both shocks that we, the, the, that we investigate. So notice that we, so all our restrictions are on this high frequency part of the VR. We put no restrictions whatsoever on the low frequency variables, on the, on the Ys. Right? Dot means uh, no restriction. So, um, so this decomposes uh, the surprises into two orthogonal shocks. And uh, what we impose are just signs of the co-movement, right? So this, this is a set identification. This is not a sharp identification, which means that there is a, there is, there is a, um, uh, there is an uncertainty, uh, there's an uncertainty about the rotation. Yeah? We, we're indifferent about any rotations of the two orthogonal shocks that are still consistent with, um, with the sign restrictions, and this inflates our error bands uh, appropriately. Now, as a robustness check, we do something much simpler than that. Uh, namely, it's something that, for, for a lack of better idea, we call the um, poor man's sign restriction. So this is um, the proceed in this procedure, we just, ma we just manually uh, classify events as either, um, uh, as either policy uh, shocks or information shocks based on the co-movement. Yeah? So whenever the co-movement is uh, negative, we classify, we classify it as a, as a monetary policy shock. When it's positive, we classify it as, a, as an information shock. And, uh, yeah, and, the, and the results are similar for, for uh, in either case. So now, uh, for comparison, um, le let's consider the standard high-frequency identification in which um, uh, one just uses a single surprise, an interest rate surprise. And, um, and this single interest rate surprise is, a, is, is considered as a proxy for a monetary policy shock. So here we abstract from uh, information effects, like most of the literature, and we just use the VR to track how the, how the economy responds to, uh, to, this, uh, to these interest rate surprises. So let me now start with the, with the results, and let's actually start with the simple, uh, with the standard high frequency identification. So these are the responses of the, of the, um, of the, of the variables in our VR to, uh, to, a, to, a, to a one standard deviation positive interest rate surprise. So in the first row, you see, you see just a blip, yeah, because the surprises are just blips, yeah, they're IID. So that's by, that is by construction. 
And then in the following rows, you see how the low frequency variables in the VR uh, respond. So you see um, a protracted increase in the, in the bond yield, um, uh, decline in the stock market, and gradual effect on GDP and, uh, and prices, and some increased indexes bond premium. So par in particular, I want you to, uh, to notice this very gradual response of the, uh, of the price level, which is a typical finding in the, in the VR literature, right? So in many VRs, we find the price puzzle, so actually a slightly positive uh, in re response of prices. Initially, it, it becomes negative only after some time. So in this case, when you use this high frequency identification, you don't get a price puzzle. But the, still, the, the uh, response of the price level is extremely uh, slow. So now let's run our, our uh, more sophisticated VR that distinguishes these two shocks, monetary policy shock and uh, central bank information shock. And in the first two rows, this time we, we need two surprises to, 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 um, to uncover these two shocks. In the first uh, two rows, you again see blips. And moreover, these blips, they're not surprising because they just reflect our identifying assumptions. Yeah? So let me now just zoom in on the low frequency variables that are uh, unrestricted. And therefore, then all the results are, are sitting here. So you see that this, res this sign restriction that we impose, the restriction that we impose on the co-movement of the interest rate and stock price surprises, that this uh, simple restriction separates two completely different shocks, yeah? a contractionary shock from an expansionary shock. Yeah? So both shocks in both uh, the second and third column, you see, both shocks are associated, you see that both shocks are associated with, uh, with an increase in the, in the bond yield, yeah? but here the similarities end. So uh, the, all the re remaining re impulse responses are exactly opposite. So after a monetary policy shock, you see, um, you see a contraction. And after the information shock, you see uh, an expansion. Now, um, and if you compare, the, the, for example, again, the GDP deflator, you, know, you see that the response of, uh, of it is, is much more vigorous than uh, in, in, in the case where we just use uh, standard high frequency identification. Right? So in light of our analysis, this very gradual response of prices is um, just um, uh, you know, an effect of a, of a mix of uh, surprises that cause a pretty vigorous uh, response of prices and, some pr and, and other types of surprises that, of, of uh, yeah, central bank uh, surprises that cause an increase in the prices. Yeah? And uh, after you mix the two, you get this very, very gradual uh, decline because in the end, monetary policy shocks dominate in, in this mix. <laughs> So this is so this is the this is the, the 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 core result of the of the paper. Now this is what the shocks look over time. So this is just to uh, to illustrate that uh, you, every, every month in, in our procedure every month you see some different mix of uh, of monetary policy and central bank information shocks. They both type of shocks uh, occur throughout the sample, so it's not uh, yeah, it's not driven by by uh, by some uh, some selected episodes. Now we've repeated the same uh, procedure for the euro area. So first we we've created a data set of ECB announcement uh, surprises using a, a similar approach. Uh, we have 284 ECB policy announcements from 1999 to 2016, and we cover both press releases and press conferences, where also a lot of information is, is released, and, and, and press conferences have been a, a standard feature of, uh, of, of communication of the ECB since the start. And um, uh, so when you look at this plot, this is the analogous scatter plot uh, of, for, for the ECB surprises. When you look at this plot, you see that the negatively sloped line through the origin is an even poorer description of, this, uh, of, the, of what's happening here. Yeah? So if anything, the mix, there is even a more even mix between um, uh, monetary policy shocks and, and information shocks. So then VR is when we when we apply the, when we use the same run the same VR the results are similar to the US, uh, with this exception that they reflect that the the, the, mix, the the share of information shocks in the mix uh, is a bit higher in the euro area. So if you look at the responses to just all interest rate surprises yeah, in this standard high frequency identification, you see that uh, on average interest positive interest rate surprises are followed by an increase in the S&P 500 and by a decline in the, in the bond spread. Uh, 
However, when, you, when, we, when, when we separate the two shocks, they are based on the co-movement of, uh, of interest rates and stock prices, uh, yeah, this, uh, you, you see that this, uh, yeah, this, 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 these results are, are a mix of uh, contractionary shocks and expansionary shocks. So now we, uh, what, what does this imply for a, stra for, for a, cali for a standard, calibration of standard uh, DSG models? No? So we look at these results through the lens of, um, of a DSG model, a, a la Gertler Karadi, a new Keynesian model with financial frictions, and we match the impulse responses. So when we match the impulse responses obtained with this high frequency identification, then you rem remember this very gradual response of prices, we need very high uh, nominal rigidities to match that. With these high nominal rigidities, we match the GDP decline uh, without the need for any financial frictions. However, when we uh, then match the impulse responses to the monetary policy shocks that we estimate, that's clean of these information effects, um, we find that, um, uh, well, you remember that prices uh, respond faster, so we need less uh, nominal rigidities to, to explain that. Then, uh, and, but then, to match the uh, responses of GDP, you need financial frictions in the picture. But that's great because we also this helps us to match this increase in the in the bond spreads. Yeah? So everything falls into into place. So in our, according to our identification, the nominal frictions are less important, and financial frictions are more important than you would think looking at the standard um, uh, at the standard high frequency identification. Now, when, when it comes to, this, to responses of the, of the, to the information shock, so these are more, um, more of, a, of an interesting, uh, well, more, more, more of an untrivial uh, uh, thing, because they, they're kind of new. So um, there are two possible stories that w one can tell about these impulse responses. So one is that uh, central banks have superior information about the fundamentals, and this is the well, the, the story that goes back to Romer Romer 2000 is, has not been uncontested, but okay. So if the, superior, if the central banks have superior knowledge about fundamentals, the impulse response that we see is just a materialization, right? So the central bank sees some fundamentals better and their effects materialize in these impulse responses. So the central bank just predicts uh, these responses. It does not cause them. The, the fundamentals are there, right, and the causes for, for, the, for the expansion of the economy are, are there anyway, and the agents would have figured it out uh, anyway, right, that, this, that, the, that the boom is, uh, is, is, is coming. So the, the only effect of the announcement is that agents learn a little earlier about those fundamentals, but they would have learned about them uh, soon anyway. Right? So there's very little causal effect of the announcement, and most of that is just that the central bank predicts the, the subsequent uh, trajectory of the economy. Now, this is the story of Nakamura and Steinson, and we also, mm, yeah, we, we also uh, yeah, have a, have a stellar story like this in the, in the paper. But now, there is an alternative story, which is unexplored in the paper, uh, which is that these announcements are self-fulfilling. So if the, the state of the economy, if the, if the equilibrium depends on the level of confidence of the agents, or if, the, if there are strong uh, strategic complementarities, then uh, a public signal does not need to be precise in order to affect the, um, the equilibrium strongly. Right? So in this case, the announcement would cause the, traje the, the trajectories of the economy that we observe. So to conclude, we partition interest rate surprises into two components, monetary po a monetary policy shock, which is an inter interest rate increase which is followed by a contraction, and a central bank information shock, which is followed by an uh, expansion. Uh, the lessons, first, uh, the effects of monetary policy on the economy are, are, are stronger uh, than if, if, you, if you ignore these information effects. And the second, central bank information is relevant. However, we don't know if it causes or if it merely predicts the trajectory of the economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marek. The discussion is uh, refit. Thank you. Um, and until my presentation goes up there, let me give you the basic roadmap. My presentation is going to have two subheadings. One is giving a history of thought. The second one is whining about the paper. Um, I usually start from the second one um, and only do that. 
But given the mixed audience here, I thought it would be useful to talk about you know, where this paper stands in our understanding of monetary economics and its measurement. Um, you know, some of you might be surprised that in this day and age, we are still thinking whether monetary policy has real effects and how much and how soon and how large and how persistent. Um, and that's because essentially, uh, because as citizens we're lucky, but as economists we're unlucky that central banks don't do random policy actions. So, you know, in general, monetary policy changes for a reason, and therefore the cause is that reason, not monetary policy, and therefore it's not easy to identify what contribution monetary policy has. Right? Okay. So usually, um, going back at least 40 years, right, we use VARs with quarterly data because GDP is measured quarterly and we care about that. Right? Um, and those VARs would have something like, you know, let's say GDP and inflation and monetary policy, right? some interest rate. And the issue there is how do you identify the exogenous monetary policy innovation, right? Um, the standard is the Cholesky factoring. That's essentially a bunch of zero restrictions. And it says, okay, you know, that which is affected by other macro developments this quarter but does not affect them is the monetary policy surprise, right? Um, and that thing is called a shock. And that language is important. A monetary policy shock is a orthogonal innovation in the policy, and the orthogonality condition is with respect to the state of the economy. It's orthogonal to GDP and inflation, right? Good, and then you can trace out what that shock does to other stuff. We could think of other restrictions to identify, right? You know, we can think of sign restrictions, we can think of long run restrictions, we can think of other zero restrictions, there are many. Um, but they all have the same idea, you know, place enough restrictions such that you're going to identify something that's orthogonal to the current state of the economy and you can tease out this effect on variables of interest. Now this leads to various puzzles. The best known is what Marek already talked about, is the price puzzle, which is in a VAR of this sort, right, um, if you have a monetary policy shock today, inflation first seems to go up. And we kind of understand why. That's because your VAR is too small. Your central bank actually knows more than what is in the VAR. These guys aren't stupid. They see that inflation is coming. They raise interest rates. But your VAR doesn't capture this. So it seems like higher interest rates are causing higher inflation initially. Okay? So, and, and this is something important. This is the beginning of the information problem. If the central bank knows more, then I'm going to see this in the VAR in weird ways. Okay? Good. Now, a kind of parallel literature is, is to say, okay, we give up on this high frequency, you know, orthogonal shocks to the state of the economy altogether, and we're going to look at things that are very high frequency where identification is trivial. I'm going to look at, you know, what happens to the, let's say, the 10 year yield, you know, in the 10 minutes around the announcement of the policy. Okay? Their causality is clear. Policy does not react to what has happened to the 10 year yield, you know, five minutes ago. Okay, if there is a systematic relationship, clearly the causality goes from policy to your high frequency other variables. Good. Um, this goes back to work of Cook and Hahn and others, but the good work begins with the paper by Ken Kuttner who says, you know, we can measure monetary policy surprises from market-based indicators and use these precisely measured surprises as controls for the effect of monetary policy on other asset prices. Good. You do that, and what you measure this time is called a surprise. That too is an orthogonality condition, but this time the condition is that the innovation is orthogonal to the information set of the market participants. These guys have learned something that they didn't know before. What they learned is, ooh, monetary policy tightened by 25 basis points, I thought they wouldn't change it now. Okay? Now, these two things, the VAR shock and the event study surprise, will be the same under certain conditions. In particular, if the market participants know exactly what is in the VAR. If those information sets overlap, then what is a shock for the VAR is the same thing as what is a surprise for the event study. If they differ, then they measure different animals. Cool. All right. Now, what is nice here is we no longer haggle about identification. However, 
we don't know how to move from here to, you know, now that I measured the surprise, since this is not a VAR shock, I don't know how to think of how this relates to inflation, you know, six quarters from now. All right. It is also the case that if you run these high frequency regressions, you're going to find much higher R squares for fixed income stuff than for stock prices. Okay? And that's something very relevant for this paper. And the standard line, I'm a big proponent of this, is, you know, who understands stock prices anyway? And monetary policy has multiple effects because on the one hand, you're jacking up interest rates, you know, bad for stock prices. On the other hand, you're probably jacking up interest rates for a reason. If, if the stock market participants think that, oh, the central bank thinks things will be better, that's why they are raising interest rates, then this is higher expected dividends in the near future, right? So these two effects pull in opposite directions. And in fact, this is the main identification mechanism in this paper. All right. Now, in between, if you run these regressions, and if you haven't done this, you're going to be surprised mildly. You know, take the half an hour around the FOMC release, look at the change in the 10 year US yield, right? And ask if I run a regression of this on the policy surprise, what is my R squared? Okay? You know, do it on the three month yield, your R squared is essentially like one. Right? On the 10-year yield, it's about 8%, which makes you ask, you know, what the hell is the other 92%? Right? So it turns out the other 92% is also the FOMC action, but it's, it's there because the FOMC doesn't just come out and say, you know, 25 basis points. It comes out and says 25 basis points because we foresee, you know, headwinds, blah, blah, whatever, you know, bad things, good things, but there's a lot other than the policy action announcement in there. So in work with Brian Sack and, and um, Eric Swanson, we said, you know, we could, we could measure this. We can quantify this. We can think of monetary policy as a two-dimensional animal where the central bank does something and says something, and saying something actually has a lot of effect on longer-term yields. Now, this is a, we used to call this target and path. Path is now what is called forward guidance, but that language hadn't been invented yet. This is a very particular case of central bank information where the central bank informs the public of its own future actions that it perceives itself following. This is a very natural way of central bank having superior information. It's not about the state of the economy. It's about the state of monetary policy, okay? And that was, you know, I guess, the obvious starting point to think of, okay, what are the things that the central bank is signaling? But then you could ask, okay, why is the central bank signaling a, say, tighter policy path than I expected? If the answer is, you know, we want to get to our inflation target faster, fine. This is a, you know, good old style monetary policy shock. But if the answer is, well, because we think that demand is going to increase much faster than you think, and therefore we're following our own rule exactly, then there is no monetary policy shock in the VAR sense. This is purely a surprise to you because I hadn't foreseen demand increasing as fast. Okay? Good. Now, mechanically, these two literatures were two separate literatures that converged with the invention of proxy VARs. You can think of these as you know, instrumental va variable VARs, which would not be exactly correct, but you know, not too wrong either. Okay? And you know, Stock and Watson and Morton Round and others, they have been using these things. And those two things, for the purpose of monetary policy, came together with the celebrated paper of Mark and Peter. Right? They were the first to properly use these surprises in a VAR to inform the policy shocks. Nice. And that paper also has a section that was reminded to me by Peter yesterday on Fed information where they say, well, okay, we find these effects, but you know, let's think whether we're finding these effects uh, off of the surprises in a identified VAR because the Fed signals something that the markets don't know. So they control for the difference between the consensus forecast and the consensus survey, the private market survey, and the Green Book. Right. Nice. Now, this paper then, in the history of thought, essentially picks up where Gertler and Karadi leaves off and says, let's look into this information problem more deeply. 
And the way they're going to do it is to say, you know, we're going to look at stock bond correlations because we understand that positive information pulls stocks in one way and negative information pulls it in another way. Negative information is central bank just raised interest rates for no reason, right? Positive inf information is central bank raised interest rates and said because, you know, we are entering this period of wonderfully fast growth, okay? Good. So I'm not going to repeat because the paper is well written and one can Im immediately assume that the presentation will follow the same pattern, which it did. But they look at the US and the euro area, find that the separation of pure surprises versus information matters, right? And then there's a model, which I don't think is the most significant contribution of this paper, but it's, it's there and it's useful. And it is actually useful to think separately about you know, how much of the effects we see are due to stickiness and how much are due to uh, financial frictions. Now, it is a good paper, it's worth reading. Getting to whining, all right, yeah, I have things to whine about. One is, it's actually worth thinking about what is the relationship between monetary policy and stock prices. This paper takes a very strong stance on fundamentals-based stock pricing where, you know, it's essentially something like the Gordon growth formula, right? You, know, you look at dividends, you're informed that dividends are going to go up when the central bank raises interest rates, and therefore stock prices go up. Um, Jama was complaining about this yesterday, so let me follow in his footsteps, but he would complain more because particularly in this case, right, Jordi Gatti has been on a roll on this kind of papers now, where if you believe that there's a rational bubble, rational bubbles grow at the rate of interest, so interest rates go up, and I tell you that, you know, the world will be great, okay? Well, it's going to impact the stock prices in the opposite direction that is needed for the identification of this paper. So that's something that, you know, I don't know what you can do about this, but it's worth more than a footnote to say, you know, in the literature, actually, there, are, there is a lot of work that says this identification will fail, and it's actually a lower bound on the information effects that you are finding, right? If you think of non-rational bubbles, then, you know, whatever. All right, so, but that, that assumption, I think, should be a clearly articulated assumption. The other thing is, it's actually really important to think about what one does when one backs out surprises, shocks, whatnot, in market-based mechanisms. For example, my work with Brian and Eric, and you know, a lot of other people too, when you measure the monetary policy surprise from market-based indicators, right, you're saying, okay, the surprises for these people, the market-based changes show me their behavior change, and I therefore measure their surprise. Fine. On the other hand, when you do the same thing for central bank information revelation, you can think of doing this in two ways. Let me give you the example of, again, the central bank's path. It might be that the central bank in, had in mind, you know, we're not going to change the path much. But they bungled the words. And I perceived a huge change. Or they didn't bungle the words. It's just that I didn't know how to read it. Okay? You're going to see a huge path factor because the markets perceive that, ooh, the language has changed. Okay? They didn't mean to. You could think of, for example, using text-based text methods to back out what the central bank says. Assume those things work exactly right. Okay? They actually capture the meaning that the central bank is trying to convey. Right? The market-based method and that may or may not overlap. They measure two different things. One is what the central bank is saying. The other one is what the markets are hearing. Now, here that becomes really important. There is work by Giovanni Rico and Silvia Miranda Agrippino that says, you know, let's take these market-based surprises that are also used in this paper and regress them on the green book and the past green books and the changes in the green books, which are not observed by the markets at the time of that release, right? We're going to think of the fitted part of that as the information revelation and the residual as the you know, pure surprise, okay? Which is not too different from what Mark and uh, Peter did in their paper in spirit. But it is very different from what is done in this paper, 
where you don't condition on the actual information of the central bank at all. What you're measuring is the information perceived by the markets. If you were to run an event study regression afterwards, this would be fine. If you were to ask, you know, what does the perception of this information do to asset prices, this is fine. But if you're going to ask, what does it do to the real economy, then you better be correctly doing that decomposition. It better be the case that the signal received is the same thing as the information <coughs> signaled by the central bank. This method does not guarantee that. Right? So there is nothing in this method that forces the stock bond correlation based decomposition to be also correlated with the information that the central bank has or is trying to convey. Okay? Thus, what is happening here is if the market is misperceiving the central bank information, right, and you're using this to inform VAR shocks, these are not going to be good instruments. You're going to be using a very noisy instrument to proxy for your VAR, or proxy in your VAR. All right. The other thing here is the following. The paper has a very nice bit that says, you know, the Fed wasn't always issuing these statements. So when we look at the stock bond correlations in the non-statement period and the statement period, they're actually kind of different. And that difference is informative. Okay? I agree. But then, you know, the gold standard of that is in this building. Because you always have the release preceding the statement. Right? Um, so for the purpose of the proxy VAR, the two event windows for the euro area, which are the press release and the press conference, they are essentially combined together, which is the right thing to do for the purpose of this paper. But to think about how this is working out in action, it's actually very useful to separate these. And um, a great new paper that will hopefully be written by Carlo Altavilla, Roberto Motto, and others, that I know because I'm one of the others, um, <laughs> actually separates this and you know, looks at these in detail. So using that data set, and one of the things that we do there is you know, we're building this Euro area intraday event study database that's going to be a standard resource and be updated. Right? And so when you look in the press release window, this is what your stock bond correlations look like. Right? And it doesn't actually look all that much like the US. They are not like 50-50 you know, all over the place. It actually looks like a good old-fashioned monetary policy surprise with some noise. Right? It's really, and I think good for this paper, and I would have shown this, right? it's really in the press conference window that these things are all over the place. Right? When the president begins to talk, then the stock market begins to take a life of its own that is not all that correlated to the monetary policy indicator that they use and I replicated here. All right. This is minor, but I'm going to say this. Um, there's a confounding factor that we were careful to think of, and you should too, which is smack in the middle of that press conference, the US initial claims is released. And the initial claims affects US stock, US stock prices, but also the European stock prices and the OIS here. So you, it's going to affect your correlations, and that's something worth controlling for. The R squares are low, but the R squares in these information regressions are also low. So we understand that apparently those low R squares does something large in the VARs. It's worth controlling for. All right. I'm going to leave with this. What the hell is the central bank information? What is it that a lot of people who are central bankers, you know, I'm going to ask Frank, you know, <laughs> what is it that you know that other people don't? This is actually really important. It doesn't have to be answered in this paper, but it is important that we think about whether the central banks know something about the future, know something about the now cast, know something about their own preferences, know something about the steady state, but what is it? And this is because this roamer and roamer that gets mentioned all the time, it's actually, that result isn't there in the great moderation period. Central banks do not have an informational advantage in inflation forecasting during the great moderation period. And the great moderation period is the sample of this paper. In fact, the Roman and Roman result is almost entirely due to the Volcker disinflation, where he comes in and says, you know, 
we're going to disinflate whatever the bloody cost, and then tells the staff, forecast inflation, and they say, it's going to fall, and yeah. <laughs> okay? so, so it's not clear at all that the central bank does have any informational advantage in forecasting, maybe some in no casting, but these are worth thinking about. Okay? And the other thing here is, I'm going to skip this, that makes it important not to refer this as a separate tool. It's not something that the central bank can exploit. The paper uses this word, and I actually would, would shy away from it as much as one can, right? Because if it's a tool, then it becomes my question whether I want to you know, correctly inform you, whether I want to give you the positive information or not. But then you're not stupid. You're going to figure out that if I'm not saying much, probably you know, things are worse than I expected. And that general equilibrium is not a pretty general equilibrium. Right? So, but it's useful to think of whether this is a tool or not, you know, whether it can be avoided, whether we want to use this, whatever. Not this paper. On the other hand, something not in the paper but in Marek's discussion or presentation was, you know, it's really important that we think of whether the link is causal. Is it that, because the VAR is a causal mechanism if it's an identified VAR, right? So the early part of the paper reads as if, you know, because the central bank comes out and signals that bad things are going to come up, look, bad things are happening. That's probably not the case. That's not what the model is suggesting, right? But then we have to think of what is the case. All right. I'll let you read the conclusions and thank Frank for his patience. Thank you very much. Thank me. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Refet. So we have um, 11 minutes for uh, discussion and answer. I suggest we get some questions, and then I'll give the floor back to Marek. Annette, and then Sevnem. I agree with Refet's comment that I don't think the central banks are actually that better informed than Deutsche Bank or Goldman Sachs. I think the, the main problem with this whole literature about the Fed information effect is that the Fed fund futures are a completely messed up measurement of monetary policy. Because if monetary policy is effective, then suppose you had a case where there was only a good and a bad state. And the central bank said, we will do whatever it takes to make sure the bad state doesn't happen. Then, well, in a good state, you're going to have, by a Taylor rule, the interest rate is going to be higher. And so you could see that a very accommodating monetary policy that basically made the bad state never happen would show up as an increase in the federal funds rate. And that's why when you look at the quadrants, you can get points where the stock market goes up, the futures go up. It's precisely because monetary policy works, not because the central banks are better informed. Um, very nice paper and very nice discussion. I'm an outsider to this literature, but um, I find it very interesting uh, that you know, the European Central Bank uh, authors focusing on the U.S. and, you know, why not the Europe, where exactly, as Refet said, uh, these two different windows is the gold standard in this building. So you have the, you know, the statement in, I guess, this council meeting at 145, and then there is the press conference later. And in fact, we just heard from Refet that, that he's working on it. And I recently saw a paper by John Rogers, uh, which is ironic because they're all Fed uh, <laughs> co-authors, John Rogers and Andy Kane and there's a third uh, Fed quarter, and they actually exactly do this. They, they do exactly what you know, you're trying to do and what Refet just mentioned. They are doing, try to understand the surprise and the information content of the ECB using these two windows. And one interesting thing they find is, uh, this goes to the last comment Refet made, what the hell the central bank knows. They do find this uh, perverse wrong direction uh, effect in the information window. The, the GDP goes wrong way, like Nakamura Steinson. But they also find this using the uh, OMT and then the European crisis, the preserved euro effect. So with an expansion of monetary policy, you have the appreciation. But that happens not through the statement, but not through the, co um, the original statement, but through the communication windows later. So maybe you can also look at this uh, ECB policies and then uh, compare to the US. Thank you. Third, anybody else? So let me give the floor back to, to Marek, and then we'll see. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Refet, for your, for your discussion. It, it was um, very thought-provoking, as usual. 
So um, yeah, so you'll give a few reasons why um, we why our um, identification shouldn't work. You no, know, and the, the the rational bubbles and the volatility in the in the in the stock market, and that's why we also started this project full of doubts. But the the, the answer to that is in the end, uh, the the simple restriction it does separate a, a contractional shock from a, from an expansionary shocks. So the yeah, so it's surely not. Um, I mean, it, it's not the last uh, word. No one could and should refine this further. But uh, and we have uh, made a few attempts, um, and, and I'm sure other and our other papers will also do it. But um, the the point that we just want to, the message that we, we want to to leave uh, to to leave you with is that this one simple restriction is enough to separate an expansionary from a contractionary policy shock, whatever you know, noise may be still uh, remaining in, in, in both of them. Yeah. So we're very sympathetic to this, um, to the, to this paper by Miranda Agrippino and Enrico and, and others who are, and, and actually also Peter and, and Mark have done a similar exercise in their, in their paper to, to extract uh, the um, uh, Fed's information from the differences uh, between the Fed forecast and the private forecast, then this is, um, we think of this as complementary work. Now it gives you a different measurement of, uh, you know, the different approximations of the, of the same uh, uh, effects. And then you mentioned the initial jobless uh, claims and we do uh, control for, uh, for them. And then they, they change very little, but we, but do we do it uh, just to be sure. So now we have now thanks for the um, for the suggestion, and then um, on the comment of um, um, of Annette. So the the way I think um, you, you have in mind um, um, uh, such an um, idealistic situation in which a central bank perfectly neutralizes shocks, and that's why uh, you, you know you you don't even see the effect. So we think of a central bank that moves uh, rates gradually, and it's common to find uh, that uh, when, when people estimate policy rules, it's common to find interest rates smoothing, so that the central bank moves interest rates in the right direction, but not enough to completely offset the effects. So that's why you still see uh, a correlation in, in practice. Thank you. Bernard? So this is a great paper and a, a really excellent discussion. <laughs> I would like to ask you about your reaction to Otmar Issing's speech at this SNB last week, who also stressed on communication and central banking, who also stressed uh, the importance of communication, but importantly sees it as part and parcel of the central bank monetary policy strategy. So this brings me to the question of um, challenging uh, your assertion uh, as the author that there could be an independent communication policy. Uh, so my, my, my challenge there is to say, uh, you're trying to say there is an independent information shock, and like Annette, I would say central banks don't really know much more about the current, in, uh, current data. Uh, but uh, a way to reconcile is what happens in a press conference is actually an updating of the reaction function. So there is a, there is a, the, the whole communication purpose is to improve the understanding of the public, that is to reduce the friction across the intended signal and the received signal, as Ref, uh, as, as your, as discussion was saying. And that's the whole, th that's the whole point. And that's a point I've made in a paper 20 years ago myself, um, but uh, with a nice quote from Wittgenstein as a philosopher. So I'd like to go back to that, that modeling. And then the second issue, so one is it's really about reducing information friction and how to measure that. The second point is the, um, the Shin argument about a beauty contest and echo chamber. So there could be a detachment, and that's a bubble kind of thing, uh, that we go away from fundamentals if markets react to central bank communication and in turn central banks start reacting to market reaction to their communication. And I'd like to have your reaction to that. And that's, I think you were very careful in your conclusion to say you cannot rule that out. Uh, but I think that's a key issue that you need to, uh, need to, uh, need to, need to, to, to put in the modeling as well. So maybe I'm breaking, uh, breaking a bit the typical link between uh, the surprise and the systematic response. I think that the, the, the key thing is actually getting the systematic response uh, across. Okay, any last questions? Maybe if I can just add one myself. 
Um, I, mean, I guess the question is where do we end in trying to decompose these very sort of, I mean, short uh, and small surprises. Uh, what I mean is now you have a monetary policy shock and what you call an information shock. But of course, the information shock uh, that could be decomposed into information about the supply shock or an information about the demand shock. And of course, the effects of the supply shock will have very different effects on the stock market than the demand shock. Uh, and so we can add, of course, other information. We can add inflation uh, swaps uh, to try to decompose supply versus demand. Um, and, and probably somebody will do that. You should read the paper. It's already there. Oh, so, sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, so that's the I, answer. I don't know where we, so where is the no, end? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where, where is the end. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, and, and uh, so also, and this, but the, uh, this is where the literature is actually heading. No? So there is a recent paper by Barbara Rossi and Inoue who actually um, identify um, uh, the effects of policy, but recognizing that there are no two, sh no, no two shocks are alike. All shocks are different, uh, have different nature, are different, differently move the shorter pieces of the yield curve than longer pieces of the yield curve. So they go much more granular than, than we do. So I think <laughs> we're not yet um, at, at the frontier. And, um, and, and coming back to Bernard's question, so um, maybe the goal of, the, of communication is to update the, um, uh, the, the public understanding on, on the reaction function. However, so uh, information about the reaction function, that's all captured in, our, in what we lump together as monetary policy shock, right? Because updates of the reaction function will induce this negative correlation between the interest rates and, and stock prices. So for our monetary policy shock captures current policy, forward guidance, and updates about the reaction function. Thank you. Okay, I think we're right on time. Uh, time for lunch. Same place. Good job.